Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, October 25th, and we will be hearing the presentation, APA Ethics Case of the Year, a panel discussion. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your webcast toolbar. For your content questions related to the presentation, just type those again in that chat box located in your webinar toolbar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Um, I do ask, I know that this type of topic, uh, the questions can get pretty detailed, so if you do have a, a, a longer-winded question with potentially a, a f several uh, logistics or scenarios that are kind of built into it, perhaps wait and uh, contact our speakers directly after the fact. Um, but if you do have a, a question for a particular panelist, too, you can go ahead and type that in if there's someone in particular that you want to answer that question. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2019. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. In particular, today's webcast is sponsored by the California chapter of APA. So thanks to you for sponsoring today and uh, bringing about this always popular topic. Coming up next is a list of our upcoming webcasts. Uh, this is it for 2019. Uh, so if you would like to register for any of these upcoming sessions, just head over to our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And believe it or not, we're already booking 2020 sessions. So you'll be able to see those coming up here shortly as we uh, start to block out our 2020 season here. Today's webcast has been approved for 1.5 ethics CM credits, and it is available for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for on-demand distance education. We have uh, an ethics, a law, and for more information on that, head over to ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. To log today's credits, just head over to planning.org and log into your MyAPA account. And from there, you can either search by today's title or event number, the event number is there in parentheses, and you can catch the title and event number on our webcast webpage if you're not able to jot it down quickly enough here. Let's be friends. Like us on Facebook, just search Planning Webcast on Facebook and we'll pop up. There you'll be able to get up-to-date information or any changes on our sessions and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have uh, over 2,500 subscribers and over 300 recorded webcasts that are available for you. Just search Planning Webcasts on YouTube and we'll pop up and be sure to click that red button to subscribe so you get up-to-date info when we're updating our new sessions. Uh, and we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel at the conclusion today. We'll also have a PDF copy of the presentation available at the end of today's session at our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, that's it for my housekeeping items. Uh, I am now going to turn it all over to Libby. Right now, Libby, you now have those controls. It's all you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the panel discussion today is brought to you by California Chapter, in particular, the Northern Section. And uh, I'd like to take a moment now to introduce our panelists. Shannon Hake, AICP, is a transportation planning project manager with WSP in Oakland, California. She has over 12 years of experience in urban transportation with a focus on public transit and multimodal planning. Shannon currently manages a Bay Area carpool program for the nine county Bay Area WSP. She was a strategic planner at BART 
and a downtown bike pedestrian planner at the DC Department of Transportation. She served as the president of the National Capital Area Chapter of the APA and currently serves as the distance education coordinator for the Northern section of the California chapter. Next up would be Robert Bruce Olshansky, PhD, FAICP. And Rob is a professor emeritus of urban and regional planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and now resides in Albany, California, where he continues his research and practice in planning for natural hazards. For 28 years at the University of Illinois, Rob taught land use and environmental planning and served as department head as well as director of the nationally ranked MUP program. He studied recovery planning after numerous major disasters around the world and serves as a member of the board of directors of the Northern California chapter of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. Afshah Hamid, AICP, is a planning manager with the city of Vallejo, California. She has served in the public sector for over 17 years. Afshah holds a master's degree in architecture from MIT. She brings both architecture and planning to her professional practice. She's a proven leader in her field and has worked on creative development oriented solutions such as design guidelines, incentivized tools for redevelopment, consensus and collaboration through public outreach, working with stakeholders and business leaders. She's passionate about urban planning and approaches problem solving through thoughtful creative solutions that are also marketable. Afsha is the professional development director for the Northern section of the California chapter. Finally, introducing myself, Libby Tyler, also a FAICP, and I am the Ethics Review Director for the Northern Section of the California Chapter. I'm a consulting planner, serving both public and private clients and specializing in contract planning, development review, permit processing, and environmental assessment. I have over 35 years of planning experience, and I served for many years as a Community Development Services Director for the City of Urbana, Illinois. I'm a charter member of APA, and I was actually the first female planner in Illinois to be recognized as a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Our agenda for today, we're gonna to start off with a refresher on planning ethics presented by Professor Rob Olshansky. Then we're gonna be going through six of the uh, 2019 2020 ethics cases of the year that have been prepared by uh, the APA Ethics Commission Committee. And um, we're going to have uh, quite a bit of time at the end, starting a little bit after noon, to go through your specific ethics questions. So uh, be thinking about those, and um, we'll have time at the end. And a reminder for your CM credits to please. Hang in there and uh, get through our 90 minutes, and uh, uh, we hope that we're able to have a robust discussion and talk about some pretty interesting cases that I think that we can all relate to at some point in our career. So, um, and then we welcome that discussion at the end as well. So, at this point, I'm going to uh, hand this over to Professor Rob Olshansky. Okay. Um... So I'm going to start out with a few uh, introductory comments as to um, why are we here? Why are we doing this? Why is this stuff important? Um, so to me, I think the main point is that planning is a profession. When people hire us, they expect certain general qualities and capabilities. Um, they expect certain ethical standards of behavior, um, which is to say that we represent some higher value other than our own personal benefit. Or stated another way is that we represent the standards of our profession rather than just ourselves. So people expect a certain level of professional competence uh, and a certain level of professional judgment. So these are broadly represented um, here on this slide by APA's ethical principles. Um, and note this is APA's ethical principles of planning. This has nothing to do with, this is not AICP, this is not the code of ethics, this is the American Planning Association General Ethical Principles of Planning. Um, and there are three of them, which is to serve the public interest, maintain high standards of integrity, um, and to improve planning competence. 
Um, and to me, underlying all of this is a key concept, which I think is, is trust, which is that people out there, which is the public, our clients, all of the stakeholders and all the planning processes we go through, um, they need to know that they can trust us to act in the public interest with integrity and at the highest current standards of practice. So let's talk briefly about, um, specifically about AICP's ethics code. Um, it has, well, it has these, it has these five parts. Um, and really the first two are the two substantive parts of the code. And so let me talk briefly about them. Uh, so the first one is the aspirational principles. Um, and again, these are principles to which we aspire. Um, and there are three sets of principles. The first one is our overall responsibility to the public. Um, and some of the things covered under this are um, respecting the rights of others, promoting equity, um, promoting uh, broad stakeholder involvement in all planning processes, paying attention to long range consequences and the interrelatedness of decisions, uh, protecting the integrity of, natural, of the natural and built environment and so on. Uh, the second set of aspirational principles um, covers our responsibility to our clients and our employers. Um, and it means that we exercise independent judgment, we avoid conflicts of interest, and so on. Um, the third set of aspirational principles covers our responsibility to our profession and colleagues. And this has general principles of professional practice including, um, and, I, and I encourage you all to read this, I, I actually was um, struck, I, I hadn't realized when I reread it, um, how much of it has to do with contributing our time to help others and to advance the profession. Um, so, um, uh, and, and again, there's this underlying issue of trust, I think, is, is these um, three, th sets, three sets of aspirational principles um, reflect the um, trust that all of the um, all the public will have in our um, expectations of our behavior. Um, the second um, substantive part is the rules of con uh, of conduct, um, and these are 26 rules to which we are held accountable, and we can be sanctioned for violating them. So these are very specific things that, as opposed to the aspirational principles. These are things that we must do. Um, or specifically, actually, the way that they're written is there are 26 things that we must not do, um, if you look at the, the wording in all of them. Um, and again, these are the um, enforceable parts of the code, um, in fact, the laws. Um, and so we can be sanctioned by violating these, or these are the basis upon which we might make a complaint against another AICP planner. Um, so the other three parts, uh, the advisory opinions, complaints and misconduct, discipline of members, call these the administrative rules. I'm not going to go into details on those. I encourage you to read them. Um, I, I think an important thing is to know if you have any questions or, or like and see advisory opinions, if you want to issue a request for advisory um, opinions, um, you should, you're encouraged to contact the ethics officer. Um, and we don't have the contact here it's a, a later a later, a later. Slide. it's going to be on a later slide um and um just so you know that the ethics officer is um is jim peters um faicp and um and, and sort of the overall um uh um ethics administration is all of this is answerable to the aicp commission the there's the ethics committee which i think we'll be talking about and um, the Ethics Committee is appointed by the AICP president um, and ratified by the AICP commission. And the ethics officer is engaged by the, by the commission and serves at the pleasure of the commission. But any, any questions you have, any uh, complaints, um, just, just some advice on a, on a difficult situation, um, you're encouraged to, to contact them. And, and incidentally, all of the um, all of these cases that we're looking at are cases that were reported um, to the ethics officer and considered by the ethics commission. Right. Okay, thank you, thank you, Rob. 
Um, yes, and, and of course the uh, names have been names and details have been changed to <laughs> protect the guilty and the innocent. Uh, but here's the um, you know, kind of a sneak preview of end of year statistics that uh, Jim Peters has put together with the AICP and the ethics committee. Uh, there have been in 2019 so far four cases dismissed. Uh, that means there was no preliminary charge filed. Um, three cases that were dismissed after preliminary charge was filed. So upon further review uh, were then dismissed. Six cases were settled. And interesting to note of those six, five were for misuse of the AICP credentials. So that's something to be very aware of uh, accuracy and uh, how you use that credential and um, how you might observe others using that. And then there was uh, just one disciplinary action uh, and that was a letter of admonition for disclosure of confidential information, uh, which is another frequent scenario that arises. And uh, this is just a little bit more detail on the actions that were cited in those misconduct charges in 2019. Um, an example of providing um, out-of-date information, out-of-date building code, and you can imagine the ramifications of that. Um, working on a secondary job, in this case as a realtor, without notifying your supervisor. Uh, working on a rezoning that could benefit actually the planner's personal residence and uh, revealing confidential information on a project. There were two cases and finally misrepresenting the views of another professional. And this is just a breakdown, a bar chart of those different ethics topics. And this was from 2018. So honest and fair dealing, conflicts of interest, false and deceptive statements were most often seen as ethics topics that were brought to the attention of the ethics officer. And here's a little, we like maps, we're planners, a little uh, breakdown um, in terms of our regions, AICP regions, just showing the number of cases uh, in each of these. And of course, this would be related to um, number of planners, obviously. Uh, and this includes 2018 as well as part of 2019. And um, uh, just, just showing that breakdown. Okay, all the scenarios have a, a fun cast of characters. Uh, just so you know, uh, we've got the consultant, Jane, who's AICP, the county planner, Dan, also AICP, town planner, Catherine, AICP, uh, shooting her selfie there. <laughs> uh, we have a consultant, Marion, AICP, and finally, a city planner, Ian, who's also AICP. So all of these characters are uh, AICP credentialed. I'm going to turn it over now to Shannon, who will be taking us through the first scenario. Great, thanks, Libby. So in scenario one, uh, we have a situation where Jane, again, an AICP member, uh, runs a small consulting firm and has worked on a new comprehensive plan for Hudson County. And she did that as a subconsultant to a larger firm, Gargan. The comp plan recently won an APA award, and Gargan has been actively promoting the project at national and state planning conferences. Next slide. Meanwhile, Gargan's chief planner, Marion, also AICP, has told, has told the firm's subcontractors on the plan, including Jane, that they're not allowed to mention the plan in their own marketing materials. Marion says that since the contract was Gargan's, the only credit should go to Gargan and not its sub. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to ask Afshan uh, a couple of questions. So next slide has a couple of the questions. Is this appropriate for Marion and Gargan? Uh, could Marion be the subject of an ethics misconduct complaint? And then if you go to the next slide, kind of a follow-up question. That first example was between a prime contractor and a subcontractor, but what if the situation were changed slightly? What if the client was the one saying that a consultant could not promote its work? Is that ethically appropriate? Afshan, what do you say? 
Well, um, you know, a number of things arise from the ethics code rules of conduct. Uh, one of them is we shall neither deliberately nor reckless indif indifference misrepresent the qualifications, views, and findings of other professionals. Um, so that's one that really stands out for me. And then the second one is under the ethics code principles, we shall describe and comment on the work and views of other professionals in a fair and professional manner. Um, and other things that do come uh, as well is we shall not use the product of others' efforts to seek professional recognition or a claim intended for producers of original work. Great. What are the? Um, what do you think about the follow-up question? If um, if the situation were changed and it was the client saying the consultant couldn't promote its work, um, would that be any different? I think it all goes back to the ethics code and the principles. Um, and I think that there is professional work done here, and the, the intent is that we have to be transparent and we have to recognize uh, the work that's been done by professionals in a fair and professional manner. So I think regardless of the, the tables being turned, um, in, in my opinion, uh, we still have to go by the ethics code and the principles. Great, thanks Afshan. Okay, uh, we're going to move on now to the second scenario, which I would like to introduce. And uh, this is on the topic of workplace harassment. Marion, AICP is a planning consultant, and you uh, met her a few slides back. She's been approached by two staff planners. They tell her that Dan, AICP, the planning director of Hudson County, has made unwanted sexual comments to each of them at APA chapter events. And we're gonna note that Dan is also an APA chapter officer. So the questions we have here, uh, this will be uh, directed to Shannon. Uh, first, does Marion have any obligations under the AICP ethics code in this case? Uh, Follow-up question, should she talk directly to Dan? about this? And thirdly, should she talk to someone else, such as a chapter president of that chapter? So at this so point, I I'm going to go I ahead and ask, ask Shannon what she thinks. Great. I think that uh, this is a really interesting scenario, and I believe that Marion does have an obligation to do something, uh, though the AICP ethics code is not specific about a situation like this. Um, but there are two principles in the ethics code uh, that have applicable responsibilities. One is, of course, protecting and enhancing the integrity of our profession. And secondly, uh, there is that principle uh, that uh, Rob had shared earlier about contributing time and resources to the professional, professional development of others. It sounded like in this situation, it was two younger planners who were, um, who were maybe noticing something. They were just staff planners. And I think that this might be one of those instances uh, where uh, it would be appropriate uh, for Marion to um, to protect them and to um, to honor what what they said. And then there are also two applicable rules of conduct here. Um, one is uh, Ethics Rule Number Twenty, uh, and that is we shall not unlawfully discriminate against another person um, as sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination. I think that that's important to note. Uh, and also we shall not deliberately, deliberately commit any wrongful act. And uh, many would, would say that this is a wrongful act. So what should she do? Um, since she's a consultant and Dan is the planning director, she might not feel comfortable uh, directly calling out the planning director. Uh, so I don't think that she necessarily needs to speak to Dan. Um, she could file a complaint with the ethics officer, and as such, she could do so anonymously. Um, she could talk to her ethics review director at the chapter level uh, or speak with the ethics officer at the national level. I think there's also 
a corresponding part of this. Um, if the staff planners directly report to Dan, uh, Marion, I think, should provide support to them uh, to follow the workplace harassment, harassment process of Hudson County. Uh, there's definitely got to be a rule, rule on this somewhere. Uh, it's a tricky situation because there are concerns here not just in how Dan is representing the, uh, the chapter, uh, but also how he might be uh, working within his, uh, his employer. Okay, thank you, Shannon. And uh, moving on to the third scenario, I'm going to ask Afshan if she can introduce this one. Thank you, Libby. Catherine, AICP, a planner with the town of Worcester, has been telling developers not to hire Jane, AICP, a local planning consultant. Catherine has been saying that Jane's performance on previous projects has been unsatisfactory. The questions, are Catherine's negative comments about Jane a potential ethics violation? Uh, and then secondly, how else could Catherine have handled this situation? And uh, Rob will be responding to this scenario. Um, yeah, so I, um, so I was thinking about uh, the details of this case, and I, I was started out by wondering whether this might be okay under some circumstances. I was sort of pondering, you know, whether it matters whether they asked her specifically what she knows about Jane, um, or is she just voluntarily going out of her way to tell everybody, even those who don't ask? Um, you know, does it matter what she's saying? Maybe she's talking about specific problems with um, with um, uh, Jane's behavior, or maybe just generally that she does poor work in general. You know, is is somebody who shouldn't be trusted. I was also, of course, wondering. It's not relevant to this, but one that has to wonder why um, she is behaving this way. Um, but anyway, so thinking through all these things, I, I concluded that it's really, generally speaking, not okay. <laughs> Um, for her to make these comments to the developers about Jane. Um, it's not okay to make comments about other professionals unless you were formally asked for a reference on a specific project that you actually know about. Um, you know, it, and, and if, in this case, if, um, if um, Catherine knows of other bad work that Jane has done, things that she doesn't have direct that Catherine doesn't have direct experience with, she could always encourage the developers to do their homework and to check references. Um, so I, I think, you know, um, it, to me, so the, the two, um, the two uh, code provisions that, um, uh, that pertain here is um, the, the principles 3C, we shall describe the work and views of other professionals in a fair and professional manner. And to me, this fair and professional manner is really the is really the key here, which is that if she's asked, um, she could tell of her actual experiences directly with Jane. Um, and if she does so, she should do it in a fair and professional manner. She should be fair and balanced. Um, and if she wants to encourage them to check references for other things that Jane has done, she can she can do that um, in a fair and professional manner and, and just leave it that way. Um, and again, the other um, the other um, relevant rule here is from the rules of conduct number 10, which is that we shall neither deliberately nor with reckless indifference misrepresent the qualifications, views, and findings of other professionals. Um, we don't know whether she was deliberately or with reckless indifference misrepresenting the qualifications, um, but this could pertain in this case. But again, I think the really important thing is describing the work and views of other professionals in a fair and professional manner. And this means that it, it needs to be that way and it should only relate to our direct experience. Thank you, Rob. And uh, why don't you go ahead and take us through this uh, fourth scenario on gifts? Okay, so we have we have another player who's not previously been introduced to us, which is Ballers Are Us. 
um, BRU, which um, is a company that sells street furniture. And they're sponsoring an exhibit booth at the um, state planning conference. Um, in addition to sponsoring that booth, they're also hosting an evening reception at the conference um, featuring free food and cocktails. But um, they're hosting this reception, but they've only invited municipal planners. So it's an invitation only event um, for municipal planners, um, which is who are, in fact, their potential clients to the reception. Um, so the questions are, um, is this a potential violation of the AACP ethics code? And, and who's violating? So BRU, is BRU violating it? Um, are any AICP public planners who attend the reception violating it? And, um, and I think implied in this next question here, um, what about the conference organizers for their inaction? Are they violating the code? And actually that's kind of a, um, it's come up in a, in a couple of these things so far that I think important for us to remember is sometimes an inaction um, might violate the code. So anyway, so that last question is, you know, if so, what should the conference organizers do about it? And I think Libby is responding. Yeah, I like this one. This is a this is a good scenario, and I think we can all relate at some level. Uh, my first reaction was, "Oh my God, how tacky!" So we have our ethical principles um, and our code, our rules of conduct, but we also have um, kind of our expectations of. Uh, fair play and, um, you know, just uh, including people. Remember back uh, perhaps when you were a child or a younger person, um, imagine standing around with a, in a circle of your friends or colleagues, whomever, and uh, Betty says, um, hey, Jimmy, are you coming to my birthday party? Skips over Libby and then asks the next person, well, how, how do I feel? You know, you don't feel very well. so." as poor taste as well. And, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, which company to get your next batch of bollards from, you know, <laughs> you may want one with better manners, but we'll leave that aside. Um, they're just, it's no fun if you're not invited, right? Um, but the other reason I like this as an example is um, it's, it's not a direct gift. And I, I think that uh, we all recognize um, the direct gifts that might be perceived or in fact a conflict of interest uh, to a public employee in particular um, as what it is, uh, which could be, you know, for, could be seen as a form of bribe. And that's uh, obviously unethical and uh, for many employees could be illegal as well. Uh, so this is indirect. And I think that's why it's fruitful to, um, examine it a little more carefully and um, uh, again think about what is there a quid pro quo here um, are we uh, is this sort of a, a pay to pay to play and uh, we're going to invite just the um, client communities and maybe it's going to be very lavish and this type of thing so that could be seen as a form of gift and in that case um, really need to pay attention and our principles to interrelatedness of decisions. So somebody could easily draw the line between this gala uh, at the uh, chapter event to maybe the award of a contract, Bollard's contract, for example. Um, you can see that relatedness. And then um, that independent, we shall exercise independent professional judgment on behalf of our clients and employers and uh, always be listening for that small voice. Oh gosh, that sounds like fun, but is this fair? How's this going to look? And I would add um, as well, uh, the principle 3A, we shall protect and enhance the integrity of our profession. So if we have at this chapter conference, uh, indication as part of the program that there's this uh, uh, for clients only event that's at the conference facility, uh, how does that really promote the integrity of our profession? Well, obviously it doesn't. And then drilling down uh, into our rules of conduct, we shall not as public officials or employees accept from any 
anyone other than our public employer any compensation, commission, rebate, or other advantage that may be perceived is related to our public office or employment. So it's the perception here. Um, I would say uh, for the conference organizers, um, you know, this is perhaps, you know, through uh, not through allowing this to be on the program, um, even though they have not directly uh, involved in that particular event, um, they're still in a way colluding with it. And so I would say if it's going to be at the conference, it should be for all members, um, you know, that you cannot look at that ethical violation. And we might make distinctions, uh, say, on an alumni gathering, or this type of thing, but that's um, not about uh, procuring uh, contract services. For BRU, um, the Bullards are us, uh, I would uh, open up the invite or go off site and mix it up. Don't have it just be clients. Uh, again, it's the perception. Uh, so have your, your friends, your colleagues, and uh, make it a more of a general way to, to thank the community uh, for, uh, for working with you and to just celebrate. Maybe it's been a good year for Bullards R Us. A lot of Bullards are getting sold. Uh, and in general, I think since we do deal with gifts quite a bit, um, I think there's some good rules of thumb. Um, if you are given a form of gift by a customer, or a client, um, a good rule of thumb is it should be shared with everyone. It should be shareable with everyone. Say you're in a public office in particular. So the box of chocolates is probably acceptable if you disclose it and you share it. But what about a bottle of wine? And we had a picture of a bottle of wine uh, just the last slide, and that's problem because that's not as easily shareable, and certainly in the public office, um, that's that's not something that you're going to be able to uh, put out for others to share. Uh, another example I would give, and these are all you know real life examples from when I was a community development uh, department head. Uh, the gift cards. You know, gee, thanks, inspectors, for uh, you know helping out on this big project. Here's a gift card, um, and those—that's a gift. Um, that's not acceptable, and that would need to be returned and disclosed and returned. So, box of chocolates might be acceptable. Gift card, uh, not so much. Uh, game tickets, that type of thing. That's really not um, not something that can be defended. Certainly not for AICP or for public employees. I, I, and, and Rob, you had some more to add to that? I just want to add, so also um, uh, principle 2C states that we shall avoid a conflict of interest or even the appearance of a conflict of interest in accepting assignments from clients or employers. Now, this one is speaking about ex assignments from clients or employers, but I think the fact that um, that in the um, in the principles here that they talk about avoiding the appearance of a conflict of interest is is really important. Um, and what's the best way to test the appearance of a conflict of interest is to ask how would it look? Um, and in this case, how would this look to local taxpayers? How would it look to to other uh, street furniture vendors? How would it? Look the ultimate question, how would it look to the local newspaper? Would it be okay with you if the local news reports that this happened? You know, would you feel embarrassed by that? Um, and I think in this case, the answer is, well, yeah, I think there's an appearance of a conflict of interest. And finally, last thing in, in my pondering this, I just want to leave, invite listeners to think about the ethics of conference sponsorships. We all, this happens at all our conferences, sponsorships with receptions, meals, lanyards, tote bags, all of those things. Um, are these okay? Why are they okay? Under what circumstances are they okay? And what lines shouldn't be crossed in doing these? So I'll just let people think about those. Yeah, and I think uh, before we move on to the next scenario, I, I would say uh, when we do ethics training, these scenarios are meant to be thought provoking and they are meant to have uh, maybe a number of opinions in terms of the uh, extent to which they might represent ethical violations. And this is why we do the training. Uh, these are not black and white situations most of the time. 
And uh, that's why we have the resources of the ethics officer and um, the procedures that we have for people to ask questions and get some informal um, assistance. And we'll be having talking a little bit later on on how to get in touch with the ethics office to pose your questions. And, and hopefully we can talk a little more during the Q&A period later on in this hour. So uh, we're going to move on now to scenario five. And this one will be presented by Shannon. Thanks, Libby. In this scenario, Davis is a planner with Clyde Bank. One of the projects that she manages is scheduled to go to the city council next month for approval. It's a project that requires data analysis to determine whether a property should be inside an empowerment zone or not. She's done projects like this several times before. However, Davis's boss, Ian, who's also an AICP member, decides that Patrick, who's a non-AICP planner who, supervi who Davis supervises, should present the application to the city council. A few weeks later, Davis has passed over for a promotion, despite her excellent performance reviews and her years of experience. Instead, Patrick is given the job. A month before the city council meeting, where Davis was taken off the project, she began her gender transition and asked people to use the pronouns she, her, and hers when referring to her. In the past, she'd always dressed gender neutral, but now she occasionally wears a skirt to work. Soon after Patrick's promotion, Davis decides to quit. And my questions for Afshan are, does Davis have any recourse under the AICP ethics code and are there grounds for a misconduct case against Ian? Thank you, Shannon. I think uh, on this one, uh, this is a really tricky one. Um, and there's a lot of gray area here. This is also one that I think uh, overlaps on many different uh, ethical principles. And I just want to go back to one of the main principles where, um, you know, in this case, uh, Davis has clearly uh, shown and demonstrated that she is capable of the work, her performance reviews are good. So it brings into question why someone else is presenting her work um, on at a council meeting. And I think so going back to the ethics case, we shall describe and comment on the work and views of other professionals in a fair and professional manner. I think it goes back to, to that. And I think it also um, goes back to the ethics code rule, rules of conduct. We shall neither deliberately nor with reckless indifference, indifference misrepresent the qualification views and findings of other professionals. In addition, um, the, there are the AICP ethics code principles, uh, 1A, which says that we shall always be conscious of the rights of others. And I think this goes back to uh, some of the personal things that Davis is experiencing and uh, the transitions that Davis is going through. Um, and then in this case, the AICP ethics code to be, we shall accept the decisions of our client or employer concerning the objectives and nature of the professional services we perform, unless the course of action is illegal or plainly inconsistent with our primary obligation to the public interest. So I think this goes back to how that decision was made that Patrick should be presenting Davis's work to the city council. Um, under the AICP ethics code rules of conduct, uh, it also says that we shall not unlawfully discriminate against another person. Um, and I think this begs the question, um, is this discrimination? Um, and we shall not we shall neither deliberately nor with reckless indifference commit any wrongful act that reflects adversely on our professional fitness. Thank you. Thanks so much, Afshan. Okay, we're going to move on now to the uh, our last scenario um, is uh, regarding political donations. So that's something that. Uh, we seem to be talking about <laughs> even now uh, 
ramping up and then we'll have local elections um, next month as well. In this scenario, Gargan, great name, a consulting firm has had several planning contracts with Hudson County over the last few years, including one current project. Several county board members are up for re-election and Gargan has made campaign contributions to them. Marion, AICP, a Gargan principal, also has made personal donations to the candidates after confirming that there are no violations of state or local laws. Must have been under a certain amount, for example. So the questions that I have, uh, actually a multi-part questions for Shannon will be, first of all, does the AICP ethics code permit these campaign contributions either by Marion or other principals of Gargan who are AICP members? Secondly, should these campaign contributions preclude Gargan from bidding on any future projects with Hudson County? And finally, what if campaign contributions were being made by Dan, AICP, remember Dan, Hudson County's planning director? And is that permissible according to the AICP ethics code? So this is a tricky one, uh, as it really reflects on the principle that we understand the long-range consequences of our current actions and that we pay special attention to the interrelatedness of decisions. Um, campaign contributions by a private citizen, in the case of Marion, uh, might not be violating any, any specific laws, uh, and Marion, as a private citizen, can make her own decisions about if and whether to contribute. But there are several applicable rules of conduct here. Um, one of them is number nine, we shall not exhibit or engage in private discussions with decision makers in the planning process um, outside, of, uh, standard, the, outside of the standard planning process. Um, for example, if there was uh, something, uh, some benefit for giving a uh, a donation in this case, um, that would be uh, against what is stated in the ethics code. Uh, there's also number 11, we shall not solicit prospective clients uh, through, and in this case, I think it's really the, uh, the idea of duress. Uh, for example, if the elected official uh, felt that there was uh, some need to, um, to give a contract to uh, Marion's firm, for example, and there are a couple others. Uh, there's number 13, we shall not sell or offer to sell services by stating or implying an ability to influence decisions by improper means. Uh, for example, if the, uh, the contribution of Gargan or Marion was noted by others in the area, and for example, if, if Gargan was able to say that there was a, uh, they, they might have special power within the city council, that would be improper. And also number 19, we shall not fail to disclose the interests of our client or employer when participating in the planning process. This is one of those situations where there are a lot of gray areas. She might not be violating a law um, specifically, but again, it goes back to that perception of uh, wrongdoing. In the case of the campaign contributions by a planning director, uh, that's very clear uh, in the uh, ethics rules of conduct. Uh, it specifically says, we shall not as public officials or employees, except from anyone other than our public employer, any compensation, commission, rebate, or other advantage that may be perceived as related to our public office or employment. Um, in this case, even the perception, um, as the, the panelists have mentioned previously, the perception is the issue, uh, not just whether it's right or wrong, but if someone could see it as um, potentially violating the ethics code. So that's something to keep in mind in many of these scenarios, there is no clear line between what's okay and what's not okay. Uh, but even if there's the perception of, of something, I think that's important to note. Thank you, Shannon. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank all our panelists. And um, I would note for those listening that there are two additional scenarios. Um, and uh, this PowerPoint are all available at planning.org 
uh, slash ethics, as well as another set from last year. So if you're interested in uh, thinking through these a little more and maybe quizzing yourself, uh, those materials are available for you. I also have an important note and kind of a disclaimer that um, what we've talked about today is, is not um, formal advice or official advice and really the only avenue to seek that, um, that type of advice and for um, an informal discussion would be to please contact Jim Peters, who's the AICP ethics officer He's in the Chicago office and his uh, email is ethics at planning.org and uh, phone numbers there, 312-786-6360. So, um, you know, maybe this has piqued your interest or you have a question and if you want to seek uh, more of the official advice, uh, please do contact uh, Jim Peters. And um, again, uh, visit the website uh, planning.org slash ethics. There's like a wealth of um, materials there, um, articles, uh, other training uh, modules, and this is a great refresher. Of course, we do this, um, we or AICP do this um, for our certification maintenance, but uh, there's uh, other people who might be interested as well if you're a, a planning official or a commissioner or perhaps you're getting ready to study for your AICP exam. This is certainly very important information to have uh, for the exam and a big part of that. And also here listed are the current members of the Ethics Committee and uh, they, they work uh, along with um, the AICP Commission and with the staff, which would be Jim Peters to prepare these materials and to fulfill the functions of you know, providing that advice and um, you know, taking in the complaints that, that do happen that we talked about earlier in the presentation. So what we're going to be doing now is um, uh, we'll be moving into a Q&A session so that you may, uh, you listeners can interact and um, uh, Christine will be moderating that. I, I did want to uh, right here again um, present the presenters or panelists today along with their contact information. So if you uh, would like to follow up personally, uh, we would welcome further contact. And um, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Christine and we'll see if any questions or further comments on the scenarios have come in while we've been going through them. Thank you, Libby. Um, first question is, um, it, it, several of them came through and uh, I think it was a comment that Robert, you made. Um, the, the conference sponsorship comment that, that you made, um, particularly surrounding, you know, do conference sponsors provide lanyards or tote bags? Um, several questions have come through. Uh, it, it, they, they want you all to talk about that more. What, what in, in your opinion is okay and what isn't okay, um, particularly uh, either for those that are just simply attending the conference and, you know, they're going up to the exhibit tables and they're being offered everything from, you know, water bottles to fancy notebooks all the way to, you know, are you a public sector planner planning a conference and you have sponsors that are offering to help out? If, if you all could talk more about that, that seems to have uh, struck a chord with our listeners. <laughs> so Rob's going to start. Well, well, well uh, I asked the question because I was I was pondering it. I don't know that I have have a good answer. I'd have to say that that they've always made me a little uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, when there's, you know, one sponsor who's sponsoring the, the lunch, um, which is, and I thought about that in looking at this case, because that's not a whole lot different than paying for the reception, although everybody is invited to go to the lunch. So, you know, so, you know, obviously, you know, they're, they're supporting the, um, the conference as, as a whole, um, uh, you know, so, I mean, that's the reason why we say they're okay. But in terms of, of, of the lines to not cross, um, it, first, I mean, it has to make competing firms uh, uncomfortable. Um, and, and, and I know there is kind of a, you know, between the, among the firms and, 
and um, we used to, between the planning schools uh, and us sponsoring, having sponsorships of the conference, we would be well aware of what our competitors were doing and, and try to um, do the same thing. Um, so there is, you know, so there is, is, is that issue. Um, but I, I, I guess what I think makes it okay is as long as you draw the line that there's no, nothing else that goes with it. So you can sponsor the lunch, but that doesn't also give you the right to stand up there in front of the lunch crowd and, and talk about all your great projects and, and why you're such a terrific firm. Um, I, I think as long as it's just simple and these, you know, we just have the, the label without the logo, without any other any other material um, and again it it's it's um, uh, supports everybody who's attending the conference I think they're okay but I but sometimes they make me a little uncomfortable so I, I know we all have opinions and um, I I guess I would I would say hey don't be such a killjoy and then you started hitting on the lanyards i'm like oh no let don't pick on the lanyards my god <laughs> um and I, so i think there is a line um we do have a culture not just planners but other professions of um you know celebrating success and supporting and sponsoring and uh interactions with between public and private we know that the public sector is not going to um help make our uh events uh, necess you know, exciting, enjoyable, memorable uh, networking opportunities. So I think that this is part of our culture, but there is a line. And I think the line is very close to what I described in the office between the box of chocolates and the, um, the, the tickets or the um, gift certificate. That's, that's a line. It doesn't mean, you know, that we don't enjoy ourselves and eat the chocolates. Um, you know, let's let's celebrate um, at the conferences. Uh, let's welcome the support for things that make a uh, conference enjoyable and help to stretch our organization's dollars in providing these facilities, uh, meals, uh, whatnot. But yeah, don't don't shill, <laughs> don't shill the uh, services um, during the conference and. Um, Oh, yeah. And, and again, you know, we're actually encouraged to contribute time and resources to the professional development of students, interns, beginning professionals and other colleagues. So we do have we do have a, even an ethical obligation um, to create these um, situations where uh, these types of collateral collateral materials might be helpful. So um, let's not be killjoys. Um, but let's be smart about it and um, draw those lines. And I think that we can continue to have lanyards, I hope. <laughs> and I'm sure we have some other opinions on this. Yeah, there are opinions and they are coming in, but we will move on to another question. And if we uh, if we have time, we will come back to, um, to this question because there are lots Lots of comments and further questions. Uh, a logistical question uh, before we move on to any more of these scenario type questions. Um, if there is a uh, a potential violation, how does it how how is it determined? Is uh, is it is there some kind of panel? Is there a committee? Is it just the ethics officer determining it, or does does he? have a council that he turns to? How, how does that work? Um, well, I, I, I know the ethics officer vets things that come in and then the committee is a resource that he can use. And um, I don't know, Rob, you've been studying this if you wanted to uh, add anything there. So I think the first step is to go to Jim Peters and um, he's got, several levels of uh, evaluation and feedback, but for formal decisions, it's not just him. Uh, that fine committee that I, I showed you the names is, um, uh, is there to look at the evidence, render opinions. And um, there's, you know, it's like kind of like going to a planning commission and board of supervisors. There's 
different levels of review. So do you have anything else to add, um, Rob? Uh, yeah, so for one, I mean, there's, there's different things you can be asking for. You can just ask for an advisory opinion. You can have an informal consultation. But let's say you actually want to file a complaint. So that's in section D, adjudication of complaints of misconduct. And so anybody can file the complaint. Um, the ethics officer will, you know, make sure that there's enough information. The ethics officer then reviews the complaint, um, and um, within 30 days uh, makes a preliminary determination. Um, so the ethics officer himself could decide that it's clear that no violation has occurred and um, and dismiss the complaint. Um, of course, as with all procedures like this, the complainant can appeal that dismissal if they want to. And so obviously the next step is, um, is it, um, actually the next step is fact gathering and it's all laid out um, in the code. Um, and then the ethics officer um, on consultation with the committee um, attempts to negotiate a settlement. Um, and then finally a, um, a, a decision is made and the, I'm just looking whether the ethics officer makes the decision in consultation with the committee or the committee makes this. It looks like the ethics officer makes the decision um, in consultation with the committee. And again, there's an appeals process. Um, um, and so, yeah, this, I, I'm skimming through this now. There's actually several pages of very carefully laid out procedures. So all the answers to your question are there, but it's essentially all of these are processes that involve going first through the um, through the ethics officer, then with consultation from the committee, and every step of the process has um, has the possibility to be appealed um, to the next level. And again, this is I'm just talking about a complaint, but you can always you can always contact the ethics officer for um, for a, a, an advisory opinion for. Um, you know, in, and for informal advice. So I presume this next question, I, I think the answer is going to fall under that category of asking for advice. But let's say that you are hearing about uh, a fellow AIC peer who um, has, a, has potentially done something that is unethical, and you're hearing about it from, from another planner, and you encourage that planner to uh, report it. And they say, no, 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 I'm not going to. I don't have time for that. And you, you are AICP too, and you're hearing this, but you're not sure because it's not firsthand. You're not seeing it. Uh, what do you do? Do you let do you let it go? Do you file a formal complaint saying, you know, I'm not 100% sure that this is, you know, I'm hearing this secondhand, or do you uh, do you ask for an advisory opinion? Well, I I could start. I I think it it may depend on how serious it sounds, but I would, um, there's kind of that little voice. So if it sounds like something that is potentially serious and perhaps the person who told you, they honestly, they, they told you for a reason, whether they were clear about it or not, they were troubled and um, they may be conflicted um, they may have a relationship with the, the person that they're concerned about. They may fear retribution, um, or they may be timid or something like that. I think, I think in this case, I would, um, describe the circumstances. I would contact Jim Peters, describe the circumstances, and I'm sure that, um, he would be able to guide, um, based on what you've been able to provide on whether there is, um, you know, it's, it's such a potentially serious violation that uh, he may want to investigate quietly, or he may just say this is, this will need to ripen or rise. So I think personally, if this happened to me, I, I would call, I would call Jim uh, confidentially for an informal advice. And I think back in my career, I don't believe uh, that I've ever had that inquiry in, in my 40 years of planning. So my goodness, uh, I would want to do the right thing. Anyone else? 
Yeah, I would I would note that in a um, in a situation of either filing a complaint or asking for uh, informal advice, the person making the complaint can request confidentiality, and AICP will attempt to honor the request, but it cannot be guaranteed. Uh, so there's no guarantee of anonymity, um, and there they could potentially AICP might potentially disclose the identity of the complainant. Uh, if the disclosure is needed. So it's one of those cases where um, perhaps just asking the ethics officer initially whether the complaint should come from the person who didn't witness the behavior firsthand or whether it should really come from that other, the other uh, person who actually did see the, the behavior. That comment is kind of, like there was the um, the scenario too on workplace harassment um, because there was there was the who I'm looking here um, yeah Marion did not didn't see the behavior but these other people told her about it um, also that one had um, it was unclear in what setting the actions happened whether they were in the workplace or at the APA conference um, so I had a lot of questions about that. And so it turns out, actually, on on all of these um, scenarios, um, I um, I had a lot of questions about each of them. And if I were involved in almost all of these, I would have I feel like I would have contacted the ethics officer for advice. And in fact, that's exactly what happened because that's why all of these scenarios are here <laughs> is because these are all ones in which people contacted the ethics officer. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the most basic question of all ethics time. What is the threshold dollar limit on gifts that is acceptable? Well, I, I don't think there's a dollar um, noted in the, um, in our, ethics material for AICP that I've seen. Um, however, if you were have a public employer, there is a dollar amount and that will vary state by state, employer by employer, uh, what they what they think is um, uh, de minimis or whatever, it could be $25 or $50. So I would, um, uh, check your own employer's information and uh, use that as a guide. And of course, a, also a general note, we have our AICP code of ethics, but those of us, um, especially in the public sector, there's also state law that will apply to us um, and in some ways could be even more rigorous in many ways. So you really do need to be uh, informed about that, and if you work for uh, government, um, you will have local ethics standards that you'll need to comply with. So there could be at least three different levels of rules that you, that you need to comply with. And um, you know, if you have uh, multiple employers, then then you know multiply that as well. And I do think that um, some private employers also have ethical standards that will need to be complied with. And then we have our our own societal moral standards. And there's a criminal uh, codes to follow, the rule of law. So um, we're, not, we're not exactly free agents and AICP is just one piece of the puzzle. All right, thank you. Next question. Um, is it unethical if a town administrator and assistant have private meetings with a developer? Can you repeat that again, Christine, the private? Of course. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Is it unethical for a town administrator and assistant to have private meetings with a developer? Do we have a panelist with an opinion on that? Any 
Any any opinions? Have we stumped you? <laughs> uh, the town administrator at NAICP <laughs> and their assistant. I I I think that um, if there's two two planners there, uh, it takes place you know, properly calendared in city hall or town hall. And um, they're not uh, going to be discussing things that say should be discussed at a zoning hearing, for example. Of, of course, uh, there can be pre-application meetings and consultation. Um, those tete-a-tete, -tete, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings where it gets cozy and other people aren't there and maybe you're having lunch together, that's going to be conflict. It'll have an appearance of conflict as well. So we do need to be careful. But, um, but we know that um, our development community, as much as our residents are our clients, and we do need to be open to um, open for business. Um, and we're public employees in this example. So we do need to be there to answer questions, provide information, and to clearly uh, stay away from discussion of topics that are really better for the public venues. Uh, in California, we have the Brown Act that um, and other states have other requirements for public meetings that we'll need to honor those as well. But, but of course, we're going to have these um, smaller informal communications. Right. but. The more people, the better. Um, uh, you don't want to have those same private meetings happen with those particular same players happen repeatedly, and and I think when in doubt, it would be good practice to um, to have a have a memo afterwards as to what the content of that meeting was. Keep records yeah. of what was discussed. I, I think a lot think of uh, Communities can just schedule times um, for, you know, a, a group of town administrators, planners to be available for it's kind of like a focus meeting time for applicants, developers, interested persons to come and, and um, be able to talk with the staff. And I think that's most often what happens is these are scheduled times on the calendar for consultation. And I think the context here really matters as well, um, depending on what is being discussed. Uh, I think in some instances, the planning world is a pretty small one, and you might be on one side of the table in one position, and maybe you're, you're becoming a developer. Maybe you used to work on the, the public sector side, and now you're, you're a developer. You have an existing relationship with somebody that was formerly a colleague. I don't think there's a problem in you know, going out and um, having lunch with them or uh, or meeting up for coffee. But uh, again, it's the appearance of impropriety and I think the um, just the perception, uh, making sure that you can keep as many documented notes and um, and uh, just documentation in, in a case like that. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I think it's an issue of transparency and uh, clearly communicating out uh, so that um, there is uh, no perceived perception of bias in the future. Thank you. Uh, next question. This one comes up uh, quite often. So this is a, a good refresher for our discussion. Uh, is receiving gifts during personal social events, and the example is a drink from a colleague during golf practice, um, how, how do we deal with that? Is that okay that if you're, you're not in the workplace, you're in a personal setting, perhaps you're friends, um, but at the same time, you're also colleagues, perhaps one is a planner, one happens to be a developer, and you're either negotiating a project or, you, you know, you have an RFP out as, as you know, the planner and, you know, the developer might be interested. But at the same time, let's say you've been friends for 15 years or you went to school together and you're just getting drinks 
after work. Uh, where do we draw the line there? Well, I think because you're doing business together that, um, you know, during that period, you have a, a separate relationship and that's going to preclude uh, some of the things that you might have done before the um, application or whatever it is came about. So I, I don't think you need to sever friendship, but um, I don't think, in my opinion, it doesn't matter if it's in a social setting because there's that ongoing work-related relationship of applicant and planner or whatever it is. So you, you would need to change your kind of your rules of engagement with each other and um, split the drinks or, you know, do, do what's proper because again, it's perception. So it doesn't matter <laughs> if it's um, a social event um, that changes your relationship to each other while that particular case is going on. Um, other opinions on that? That's a, a bit of a nuance on the gift, but that's a very valid one. I know in a lot of communities, um, you may have, may be uh, working with your friends, especially smaller communities, uh, could be, could become applicants. Anyone else, any other personal experiences on that? I've stumped you again. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, so on the one hand, I, I think it really, it, it, if so your childhood friend is a developer and every year you, you know, you do a birthday party um, and you do that birthday party and gifts are exchanged. I mean, I think that's okay. Um, but on the other hand, so, I mean, it's, it's okay. And I think it's defensible. Um, but on the other hand, if your childhood friend is a developer and they're now doing business in your jurisdiction, um, it might actually be wise to, because um, people are going to know that and they're going to think there's something going on. And so it might actually be wise to bend over backwards and to purposely create a little distance during the time when that's going on. Again, just to just to preclude any um, any any misperceptions of, of biases and in fact i would you know start thinking of my i'm thinking of oneself you know you're naturally going to be inclined to want to be nice to the childhood friend um and that might create problems so it might actually be best to try to create some some distance even though technically i think the gift would be okay but it's just easier if not Okay, thank you. Next question. There were a couple of these uh, that, that were similar to, to this one. Uh, we're a consulting <sighs> firm and we host project meetings that include uh, public sector staff. Can we offer them food and beverage when they're at our offices? It seems like just normal hospitality, but could it be taken wrong? Well, my opinion, I certainly hope you don't expect them to starve. <laughs> so I, I think that's reasonable. And um, especially meetings that might be during a meal time or might be intensive where refreshments could help the meeting to continue. And um, I, I do think that those are, those are acceptable and would not be seen badly. And um, I, yeah, to me, I think that's pretty clear, and and uh, yeah, that would be the ultimate killjoy to be starved. <laughs> you have to meet with us. You can't use a restroom. You can't have water or coffee or pastries. <laughs> My opinion. I don't know if we have anyone who's more hardline on that who wants to chip in or other other opinions. The only thing I would add is that in some cases, the um, the public sector. Uh, representatives may have their own restrictions on that. Um, I wouldn't imagine that offering food or beverage uh, would violate them, but in some case, if it's if there's a really hard line, like you cannot accept anything. Um, I mean, I I can't imagine why you couldn't at least offer. I I, I see that as basic hospitality as well.
I have to agree with that. I mean, I, you know, um, there's meetings that we go to that are at least an hour or two hours away, and then the meeting itself can be a couple of hours. Um, I think sometimes it's just practical and efficient to just have like a lunchtime meeting and work through. Um, so. There are a lot of comments about this particular topic. Um, they're just kind of swarming in. But the, the one that actually kind of caught my eye, which I think makes sense. And, you know, a lot of times we, with, with some of these scenarios, we start to kind of get in the weeds. But this comment kind of takes us a step back. Um, of course, now I have to find it. Um, And there are more also there are more comments coming in about by state. There are some states that also say even, you know, outside gifts, including lunches uh, are a no, no. Um, so I, I think the the one comment that kind of made sense to me, um, isn't it the basic question of whether any exchange or special consideration is expected as a result of the basic hospitality? So um, I think kind of taking a step back and looking at it like, well, what is you're just doing it just so that the person <laughs> has something to drink because they're in the middle of a meeting and it's very normal to offer someone a beverage or a snack or you know if it is a long like, charrette or something to have food available um so I, I i i like that comment and just sort of stepping back and saying well i mean are they really trying to get anything out of it because at the end of the day that's the whole point of is it ethical or not Um, let's see, let me get another question. Oh, there was a question about uh, ut utilization of, of your of the AICP credential itself. Um, in the code of ethics, uh, is, is it talked is it talked about or is it talked about just within APA um, how you can and cannot use uh, the, the credentials, the tagline itself? So um, yeah, that's that's important. You need to be um, an AICP member in good standing um, to use that after your name. And I know APA and AICP really encourage people to use their credentials. So you'll see on the slide that we have we're all credentialed and we're we're using them. So I think that's good practice uh, when you have meetings to. Um, use a credential because that helps to um, let people know that it is an important credential for planners. Um, I know that there is a, kind of a junior AICP. Um, it's not called that, uh, but they're- um, the, that candidate, would be the candidate, the candidate program. And uh, years yeah. ago they had an associate level. It's very similar to that. So these are people who are um, working um, towards um, building their timeline so they can take the exam. So they're AICP candidate. And um, and then when they hit their um, experience timeline, um, they'll be fully credentialed. So uh, folks who might be um, learning about planning in grad school or a program are able to take the exam early and then become candidate AICP waiting for their requisite number of years of experience. Um, the FAICP is a special honorific. Um, after, I think it's 15 years as an AICP member, um, you may be nominated uh, to the College of Fellows and there's a whole process associated with that. Um, but it is, it's a, would be a very, would be a serious violation to um, claim AICP, for example, when you are not. And um, one of the consequences of violations of our rules of conduct through the ethics officer and the ethics committee can actually be to lose your credential. So if you were to persist in using that credential on letterhead, um, you know, authored authorship notes or um, business cards, this type of thing, that would be um, also serious violation. And so I don't know if you see anything else uh, specific, but, um, or any other comments on the credential. Yeah, I, I think would... we need to take it seriously. 
I would add that I think there's uh, there's a gray area in certain cases. For example, if um, if you haven't paid your dues or if you haven't met your CM requirement, um, you haven't maintained the credential. I think that's one set of issues. But maybe you you did have it act actively at one point, and then you let your certification lapse, and you should no longer be using it. Uh, but in that case, I think that's a, a little bit of a different case where there could be some flexibility if you're working to get it back um, than, for example, stating that you're an AICP credentialed member when you've not even taken the exam um, or not even really, uh, you, you, you have no claim to, to something like that. So I think there, there could be different cases in which, uh, in which there's, again, kind of a gray area. Um, but I, I do know that uh, APA watches these very closely. I know this is one of the bigger issues on the um, AICP ethics committee. Um, and I know that uh, APA is, is really calling people out on, on using it inappropriately. And, and so if you have a question about it, say you've been ill or, or had some financial hardship, or there's been a reason why you haven't been able to pay your dues or, or keep up with your CM, do call Jim Peters and describe your circumstances, and he can guide you on um, whether you can continue to use those um, use that certification in the in the interim while your issues are resolved. Yeah, we actually um, there there was a case of, of um, a, an acquaintance of mine um, who was in um, financial circumstances and and health problems and um and just sort of let it lapse and i was you know you know shocked i mean because i thought that they they really they really needed to be maintaining that um and we actually worked with them and with apa to work out an arrangement to to get it um to get it reinstated um but yeah i think maybe people were questioning this wondering you know if I, an AICP um, member in good standing, um, you know, could I miss? How do you misuse it? And and, and I, I, the answer is the primary way to misuse it is if you're, if if you're, yeah, if, if it's lapsed. So you're not supposed to use it if you no longer officially have those credentials. Um, you can get in big trouble for using it. And I think time is up. Yeah. <laughs> It sure yeah. is, and I can't believe it. We have so many more questions, um, which it, that's what happens when it comes to ethics stuff. There's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of really specific questions. Um, so sort of um, to conclude, at least from my end, I guess it, if I took anything away from what uh, you four have been saying, it's if you have a question, call Jim Peters. <laughs> Don't just, you know, kind of be wishy-washy even if you you know you just want an advisory opinion anonymously do it i mean what can it hurt right um i guess that would be <laughs> my takeaway um does anyone else have any concluding thoughts uh, well don't forget to get your cm credits so that you can continue to use your aicp credentials and um i really appreciate the the questions and uh the participation and um you know, we we tried to keep this as lively as we could. Uh, it's hard to do these, um, you know, not not live. I uh, lose a little bit of dynamism. So we appreciate you hanging in there and for your excellent questions. And and to the panelists yes, great. Um, for studying and um, and uh, giving some sage advice. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Um, and thanks to the California chapter for hosting. We had over 700 people on the line today. It was really great. Um, so thanks, everyone. Reminder, we will have a recording of this available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, and we'll have a PDF of this presentation available on our webcast webpage, uh, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So thanks, everyone, and have a great weekend. We'll talk next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.